All right, welcome to today's extraordinary seminar for the Institute for Quantum Studies. We're pleased to welcome uh, Spencer Rogers, who will speak to us today about post-selection and quantum energetics. So Spencer comes to us from Yale University, where he did his bachelor's degree. And for the past several years, he's been working uh, at the University of Rochester with uh, me, Andrew Jordan, as his supervisor. And he's published now, this is this is work, I think his fourth paper in the group. So mostly focusing on foundations of quantum mechanics. So it's especially appropriate for him to be here at the Institute for Quantum Studies, where that's one of our main interests and focus. And so uh, we're happy to have you, Spencer. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hi to everyone uh, watching at home. All right, so this talk is called Post-Selection and Quantum Energetics, and it's about the subject of energy conservation in quantum mechanics, particularly when you post-select. So I'm going to begin by talking about some of the motivations for this talk. Uh, so uh, Andrew told me about this uh, work by Yakir Aharonov uh, on super oscillations. So something they considered was a particle in a box. And this particle has uh, a wave function. And that wave function has Fourier components. And those Fourier components lie in some range. So we say it's band limited. There's a highest frequency. Uh, nevertheless, by uh, building this wave function out of these Fourier components, the, the uh, wave function oscillates faster than any of the Fourier components in this region um, near the middle. So that it, you say that it super oscillates. Uh, so an interesting question is if uh, opener uh, opens this shutter in this super oscillating region and the particle happens to get out, uh, it seems to emerge with a higher energy than uh, was ever possible while the particle was in the box. So there's the interesting question of how energy is conserved if the particle escapes. So if this gamma ray comes out of the infrared box. Uh, okay, so, uh, so how can we explain this? Well, the particle is not alone uh, in order for it to, to get out. So something has to open the box. Uh, and uh, the authors were trying to figure out the role of this opener. And uh, so they figured, well, this opener uh, can open the shutter for a short time. And if that time is short enough, all the opener really sees is uh, either nothing or a gamma photon. Um, and if a gamma photon escapes, all the opener really experiences uh, is this uh, interaction with the gamma photon. And so if it's a gamma photon to begin with, and it's a gamma photon at the end, the opener energy wouldn't change. So uh, their reasoning was that the opener energy should not change even for this uh, kind of fake gamma photon. Uh, and they do some math to show that this is the case even in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, so if the energy is not coming from the opener, where does it come from? Well, energy is conserved really over the ensemble of outcomes. So there are plenty of times uh, where the particle does not escape. And it turns out that there's a slight energy decrease if the particle does not escape. You can imagine the, the wave function is zeroed out near the shutter, which uh, affects the, the energy. Um, so this, it's hard to see, of course, but this uh, lower blob is a bit shifted relative to this upper one to the left. Um, yeah, in fact, if we don't post-select at all, the photon mean energy is unchanged. So the photon is kind of sourcing its own energy um, just over the ensemble of possible outcomes. Uh, so the apparatus, uh, they, they would say, the authors would say, does not source energy, but rather acts as a catalyst. Um, how does it act as a catalyst? Well, the possible energy change of the photon is, about, is by this amount alpha. And the energy uncertainty of the uh, opener is larger than alpha. So it's fine for the photon energy to change by this amount alpha because the total energy is uncertain by an amount larger than alpha. Uh, that's essentially what this slide is supposed to illustrate. You can see 
These are, these are um, on the same uh, scale for the x-axis. So you can see that the uh, possible energy change of the photon is sort of contained within the spread of the apparatus. Interestingly, this is just kind of the statement that a gamma photon cannot escape the box without the opener. Um, so this is a really nice, interesting story we can tell about this particular case. And I think it says a lot about energy conservation and quantum mechanics. Uh, but it's, it's not the full story. And in this story, you know, the apparatus doesn't really source energy. But there are plenty of cases we can conceive of where the apparatus does source energy and act like a battery. Uh, in fact, there's a literature on quantum measurement engines which Andrew is very much involved with. Um, the idea being that we can kind of power these engines by the act of observation itself. Uh, so uh, an example I really like is this uh, particle on an elevator. Um, the idea is that you could kind of lift a particle against a potential by checking if the particle is above a certain height. If the particle is above that height, you can kind of lift the elevator without resistance um, and the particle will settle back onto the, this higher uh, higher potential and thus gain energy. Um, energy has to come from somewhere there and some, somehow it has to come from the act of observation. Uh, and we can conceive of uh, energizing qubits by performing measurements. So uh, if the qubit Hamiltonian is sigma z, we could prepare a qubit in the ground state, measure sigma x, uh, and increase the qubit's mean energy. Um, this is, uh, since the qubit mean energy strictly increases, this is uh, quite a bit different from that super oscillating example. And energy must come from an external source. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it, there's a lot of different uh, examples, even with a single qubit that you could consider different initial states you could start with and measurement choices. Um, and it'd be good to understand the energetics in each case. So how does the apparatus energy change in each case? Okay, so the subject of this talk is energy conservation and quantum measurement um, with the understanding that me the measurement apparatus can act as a battery for the measured system. Post-selection refers to focusing on specific measurement outcomes. And the question we're most interested really and is how does the energy of the apparatus change depending on the outcome? Um, it's a more interesting question than how does the energy of the apparatus change when you don't post-select because then the answer is pretty obvious. It just has energy is conserved when you consider all outcomes. So it has to compensate it somehow. But I think uh, the issue of post-selection is a bit more subtle. And so we'll give it some attention. Uh, so I'm gonna frame the problem largely in terms of this dice example for illustrative purposes. Uh, so imagine you have a qubit in the block sphere representation, the ground and excited states are at the top and bottom poles, uh, bottom and top poles respectively. Uh, and the initial state is a state of maximal energy uncertainty situated right between the poles. Um, we perform uh, some measurements. So we, we check the spin along some axis and uh, we label that axis. F for final. Uh, if we get the upper outcome, then the photon ends up higher on the block sphere and so it has a higher energy. So there's some energy gain. And if we get the lower outcome, there's some energy loss. Now, strictly speaking, uh, the states I and uh, F, these are not energy eigenstates, but uh, they do have a mean energy associated with them. So we can say that mean energy is gained in one case and lost in the other. Okay, so that this uh, actually is all drawn to scale and describes the situation in which the uh, upper outcome is realized with uh, probability five sixths and the lower outcome is realized with probability one sixth. So, so uh, five out of six times we gain some amount of energy and uh, one out of six times we lose. Uh, that actually that same amount of energy. Uh, so uh, per six trials on average, the qubit will gain these like four units of uh, uh, energy. 
Okay. And that energy must come from somewhere, presumably the measurement apparatus. And if you like, like the measurement apparatus could really be everything that's not the cube. Um, so uh, over the course of these measurements, energy seems to flow between these two systems. But how does the measurement apparatus's change, uh, measurement apparatus's energy change uh, with each outcome? Uh, that's something we haven't answered yet. You just know that the measurement apparatus energy should compensate when you consider all outcomes. Uh, so in other words, if we were to redraw this diagram and assign uh, delta HM, so it, an energy change to the measurement apparatus for each outcome, um, what would that be? How full would these bars be? Would they be green or red, positive or negative? And as a reminder, focusing on a particular outcome is called post-selection. Uh, so some interesting questions uh, jump out immediately. One is, is the uh, energy change of the apparatus just equal and opposite to the qubit's energy change um, when you post-select? Uh, when, when you don't post-select, obviously the answer is uh, yes, when you don't post-select. Um, and is the answer protocol independent? So. In other words, uh, if we're using the same initial qubit state and measurement choice, um, do we get the same answers kind of no matter how we perform the measurement? Um, so the first question, uh, I say probably not. In the super oscillating case, we saw that the uh, particle energy change uh, is not necessarily compensated by the uh, opener when you post, when you post select. And so we expect that um, we'll see a similar thing with the qubits. And uh, as for the protocol independency, we'll see. Uh, now I should qualify all this uh, by saying the measurement apparatus is kind of a weird battery. This uh, picture of the measurement apparatus as a battery with well-defined energy is a bit misleading. Um, really, the energy uncertainty of the apparatus should be non-zero. Uh, so there's this uh, result called the wave theorem, which essentially says, and uh, some of you, this might be butchering it, but my version of it is that accurate measurements of observables that do not commute with energy require an oncilla of energy uncertainty. Um, we saw a similar thing uh, with the escaping super oscillation. So if you like, there's kind of a position measurement that goes on, uh, position not commuting with energy. And uh, we saw also that the energy uncertainty of the opener was vital for the gamma photon to escape. Okay, but even though the measurement apparatus has an uncertain energy, um, so, and it is a weird battery, that it can still deplete and charge. So it has a mean energy, and that mean can shift right or left. Um, many of you may be familiar with noisy pointers and weak measurements and those can shift as well, so similar thing. Okay, so, so we're interested in the measurement apparatus's energy change with post-selection, and we can quantify really the mean energy shift of the measurement apparatus. Um, and since we wanna know if the particular protocol matters, we can do this for different protocols and compare the answer. Uh, it'll be important to use measure, measurement models that respect energy conservation. Yeah. Okay, so in the remainder of the talk, I'll describe the two energy conserving measurement models that we looked at. One is a quantum clock model, and the other is the James Cummings model. Uh, we'll give results for the mean energy change of the measurement apparatus in each case, relating back to the DICE example. Uh, we'll talk about the similarities and the differences between the clock and James Cummings models. And at the end, I'll try to offer additional insights. Okay, so this quantum clock model uses a time-independent Hamiltonian. That's very important because we want energy to be conserved. It's a three-body model. It involves a qubit, the system being measured. It involves a clock and a pointer qubit, which stores the measurement outcome. Okay, so the Hamiltonian of this 
three body system involves three terms, the qubit energy term, the clock energy term, and uh, this interaction term. Uh, so what happens is this clock uh, is initialized left of what I call the interaction region. Eventually it gets to the interaction region because um, it's translating in Q space as a result of its Hamiltonian P. So eventually it hits this interaction region. And when it does, uh, the pointer flips if the qubit is in the state F. So really this is all checking if the qubit is in the state F. Um, so for most of time, the clock is not in the interaction region. And the total energy can really be thought of as a sum of two components, the qubit energy and the clock energy. And energy can be exchanged between these two subsystems. Uh, now, the details are a bit more involved in this, but roughly speaking, what happens in the model is we start with an initial, initial qubit state I um, and this separable three body state. Um, we evolve the system and we end up with this uh, entangled superposition where in one branch, the qubit ends in the state F and the pointer has flipped. And in the other branch, the pointer has not flipped and the qubit is in the state orthogonal to F. Now the clock state will vary slightly depending on the branch. So the state phi F and the state phi orthogonal, uh, they share much overlap but they are not exactly the same, and that's important. So in, because all we have in going from uh, this top line to the, the one beneath it is unitary evolution under this time independent Hamiltonian, the qubit energy change must be compensated by the clock in going from here to here. Um, but that's, that's globally, that's when you consider both measurement outcomes, both branches. Okay. Uh, now the clock mean energy change when you post-select on the outcome F uh, is found by basically just considering uh, the clock wave function in the branch where the qubit is in the state F. Okay. So we take the expectation value of the clock Hamiltonian in the state phi F, subtract the original, and we get this result. And the results uh, depends on qubit properties alone, which is interesting. Uh, it also involves the weak value of the clock Hamiltonian, uh, despite a lack of deliberate weak measurements. Uh, so I said we'd relate back to the dice example. Uh, so what we've done is we've figured out the uh, change in the measurement apparatus's energy with each outcome. Um, thus filled in these delta HM bars. Okay. Now, uh, when we consider all outcomes, we have to compensate the mean energy uh, gain of the, of the qubit for six trials. Um, and in fact, if we add up these red bars, we can see that we do um, end up with a bar of equal length. So uh, we knew that had to be the case because uh, of the construction. We used an energy conserving measurement model. But now we have an outcome by outcome breakdown of uh, how this happens. So this clock model result has some nice properties. Maybe just to go back one slide to appreciate what you showed. So the point is, is the answer is your question about equal and opposite. Yeah, that's one thing that's already happened here. So uh, the yeah, the apparatus energy change is not equal and opposite when you post-select. In fact, sometimes uh, both of them lose energy, both the qubit and the apparatus. Yeah, that's the freaky one at the bottom right. right? For that, I was, uh, <laughs> I needed some water. Okay, so this clock model result has some nice properties. Uh, for example, if the, qubit is prepared in an energy eigenstate, then the apparatus energy change is equal and opposite. So it's sort of responsible for the energy change of what was previously an eigenstate. Um, 
On the other hand, if we measure in the energy eigenbasis, the uh, apparatus supplies no energy, even when you post select. Um, and because the weak value occurs in this expression, we can obtain anomalous weak values. This uh, apparatus energy change can be made arbitrarily large by choosing the state's INF appropriately. And we'll see that on this slide. Uh, so if we prepare the qubit in this state uh, of X and we measure uh, spin along this axis, which uh, makes a small angle with the X axis and lies in the XZ plane, uh, there's two possible outcomes. Uh, one is very likely because of this small angle. Um, the other is very unlikely because it makes about a 180 degree angle on the block sphere. Um, if we get this uh, lower outcome, then the energy of the qubit goes down by a small amount. Uh, and it turns out that the energy of the measurement apparatus goes down by a very large amount. So they're both losing energy and the apparatus loses this kind of strange amount of energy. It's much greater than the qubit level space. We might call that an energy deficit. Uh, of course, this isn't the full story. There's another outcome, which almost always happens, right? This upper outcome. And if we get this, then there's a, actually a slight energy gain overall. And when you do a weighted average, uh, there is balance. OK, so when we use the clock model, we got these pretty nice uh, results. So uh, it was a bit surprising when the other model we looked at did not get the same results. Uh, so the James Cummings model uh, also is a bit more experimentally relevant, uh, right? Superconducting qubits, cavity QED, all that stuff. Um, and in fact, there's a paper called Energetics of a Single Qubit Gate, which does experiments uh, very much like what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is a figure from that paper. Um, now, uh, in practice, qubit measurements are usually made uh, in the energy basis, it's called dispersive measurement. And so there is the question of how we measure the qubit in other bases. These measurement engines actually really arise when we measure the qubit observables that don't commute with energy. So I'm going to talk about how to actually measure qubit observables besides energy. All right, so the goal is to measure uh, if the qubit is in this state F, which is not an energy eigenstate. And we have some constraints. So we can only directly measure qubit energy. Um, but we can also cube, couple the qubit to an oscillator, basically drive it. Um, and the coupling is via the resonant James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, which I allowed to vary with time, actually. Um, owing to some external controller of this, or some uh, time, de time dependency of a pulse. Say. Okay, so how do you uh, use these, uh, follow these constraints and still measure if the qubit is in the state F? Uh, the first step is you drive the qubit such that the F state goes to E, then you measure the qubit energy, then you drive qubit such that the E state goes to F. So you can see that if you were to start in F, that's where you'd end up. You'd get driven to E, the energy measurement would give the result E, and then you get driven back to F. Similarly, if you started in F orthogonal, you'd end in F orthogonal. All right. And uh, if you have a different initial state, like I here, okay, it gets rotated, then it gets projected onto either E or G and then gets rotated to either F or F orthogonal. And for this state I, it's really the F component of state I that ends up at F. So I, I do think that this is a faithful, uh, faithful measurement of what we're trying to measure. And one caveat of this is that the drive rotations are, are not really pure qubit rotations. Uh, to increase the purity of these rotations, uh, you need high photon number uncertainty. So imagine creating this 
uh, initializing this oscillator in a coherent state of high photon number uncertainty. Um, this is essentially how the weight theorem applies to this case. Um, okay, so why does this measurement model respect energy conservation? Or why, why do I say that it does, even though it has this time uh, dependent Hamiltonian? Well, uh, really what I'm thinking here is that uh, the excitation, total excitation number of the two body system uh, commutes with the James Cummings Hamiltonian. And so this evolution does not affect the total excitation number. Also, the direct measurement which goes on is a measurement of energy, okay, and, uh, of the qubit energy. And the qubit energy commutes with this total excitation number as well. Okay, so the model respects energy conservation and uh, changes to the qubit energy will be compensated by the oscillator. Uh, and so what are we gonna do? We're gonna look at the photon number change uh, of the oscillator for different outcomes. Okay, so uh, skipping the details of how we do that, let's just kind of get to the results. Uh, so again, with this dice example, we can assign uh, energy changes. We can, we can calculate the energy changes of the measurement apparatus. Now, importantly here, we're actually using the lowest drive angle possible. Actually, there are multiple drive angles you could use uh, that differ by pi or multiples of pi that would essentially allow you to measure in the same basis. Okay, so here we use the lowest drive angle possible, and these are the results. Um, and there is uh, energy balance overall when you consider all the outcomes. Okay, and this are yeah. Question: Can you can you go back on what the angle is the previous slides? What angle is that here? Yeah, so that is the rotation angle that the first drive executes. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's more important that it's the first drive. The second drive actually could be anything that takes you back. So this is determining but, the measurement basis. Yeah, it determines the measurement basis. Yeah. Okay. So why do you say there's a minimum? Thing? Yeah. So uh, so here's two ways I could end up at. Okay. So I could rotate F to E using the smallest angle possible, uh, or I could go at another. I could go around extra times. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Or I could even go from F to G. So the basis is fixed. You're just using the angle that minimally gets that fixed basis. To yeah. It. Okay. It's not but I don't have to. And that's why I make it explicit here that I am using that lowest angle possible. Good question. Okay. So this, this two thirds here is just a specific choice you made. It's not some it's a specific order. choice that's made in order to get these five, six probabilities. Gotcha. It maps onto the dice. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. But wait, we go back. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Go ahead. Continue. Okay. I, I was going to say that uh, this already kind of shows the protocol dependency because th these are not the results you got with the quantum clock line. Right. Uh, but further showing the protocol dependency is the fact that if I do do these kind of extra rotations by multiples of pi, I get different answers. Um, so here uh, there's Five sixths of the time, both of these guys are gaining, both the qubit and the measurement apparatus are gaining energy. This would be flipping the, the labels of basis for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flipping the labels. F maps to G. Okay. Um, but sure enough, if you try and uh, check that everything balances, you will find that it does. The uh, qubit energy gain per six trials is accounted for. Okay, so uh, in the James Cummings model, the apparatus energy shift is a function of theta, the drive angle, as opposed to theta modulo pi. And the result is not dependent on qubit properties alone. Uh, we saw that we could get anomalous shifts, right? This is a shift that's larger than h bar omega, um, which shows that these are accessible in experiment because this was a very practically minded model. And in fact, the uh, the paper below essentially sees these. I mean, they have a kind of different 
emphasis, but essentially seasons. Uh, and yeah, this all showcases the dependence of the result on protocol in, in multiple ways, really. Okay, so we, we did uh, two me measurement models. Uh, and so what are our general findings? What do these have in common? Uh, so we found that total mean energy changes when you post-select, uh, which is to say that the apparatus mean energy change does not balance the qubit mean energy change until all outcomes are considered. Anomalous energy shifts are possible. The apparatus mean energy change is not bounded by the qubit's gap energy. Um, okay, so why do the models get different results? Uh, it turns out that the non-degeneracy of the James Cummings Hamiltonian uh, uh, is important and is part of part of the difference. So uh, the James Cummings Hamiltonian involves these raising and lowering operators, which carries these factors of square root of n. Uh, and so the eigenvalues of the James Cummings Hamiltonian get like square root of n. Uh, now, if we instead uh, come up with these raising and lowering operators L, which don't carry these factors, uh, we can kind of do the same thing. You use this uh, new Hamiltonian to couple the qubit and the oscillator, um, perform the same kind of drive rotations. If we do so, we'll get a result and that'll happen to be the clock result. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss this more. It's the phase Jeff Baker. It's, it's also uh, worth noting that the weight theorem prevents perfect measurements of observables that do not commute with energy. Well, we really described approximate protocols uh, for measuring observables that don't commute with energy. Now, these protocols increase in accuracy as you increase the energy uncertainty of the apparatus. Um, but these different protocols have different ways of asymptotically approaching the targeted measurement and the shift of the mean energy of the measurement apparatus will vary uh, depending on this asymptotic. Okay, so I'm gonna talk more about why the spectrum of the James Cummings Hamiltonian matters. Uh, so if we prepare a qubit in the excited state uh, and the oscillator in vacuum, we know that we get these vacuum Rabi oscillations um, when these are on resonance and coupled. Uh, so the excitation essentially changes its hands um, and there's a, in, in time. And the similar thing happens if we prepare the oscillator in the first excited state instead. Um, we also get kind of uh, exchange oscillation. Okay, so now suppose that the qubit is prepared in the excited state and the oscillator is prepared either in vacuum or the first excited state. Uh, so the question is, can a Bayesian statistician with access to qubit energy measurements and control of the interaction strength get information about the initial oscillator state? In other words, uh, can someone uh, get information on whether they're kind of in this world or this one? And you might say, well, uh, either way, the qubit is oscillating between the excited state and the ground state. Uh, so you, you might say no. Um, but actually there is information uh, because these oscillations occur at different rates. Okay, so the probability for the qubit to be excited uh, differs as a function of time. Um, this lower oscillation, uh, this n equals one Rabi oscillation is factor by, faster by a factor of square root of two. Uh, and this has to do with the eigenvalues of the James Cummings Hamilton. Higher photon numbers means faster rates. Okay, so what does this have to do with uh, our James Cummings measurement model? Uh, so actually when we look at the pho mean photon number change, for different outcomes. Some of this can be thought of as Bayesian. Uh, so I would like to thank Cyril uh, for explaining this to me. So basically the higher photon numbers uh, will cause 
qubit to sort of overshoot its rotation. So if this qubit's prepared in I, maybe it overshoots it, ends up a little higher than targeted on the block sphere. So it actually has a higher probability of giving the result E. Um, whereas a lower photon number will undershoot and give a higher probability for G. -G. Okay, so when these uh, energy measurements occur, um, there is, if you, if you like, a kind of retrodiction that goes on uh, as to what the photon number initially was. So um, okay, so when the yeah when the photon number shifts, it's also kind of shift when we're uh, arriving at a kind of posterior photon number, it's also kind of changing for reasons like this. Okay, so you're saying if you select on E, then you tend to bias yourselves towards the higher photon numbers. Yeah, in, in this example. Um, unless the higher photon number takes you all the way, <laughs> you know, all the way around. Right? Um, but those such photon numbers, which are gonna overshoot by that much, are gonna have really low probabilities. So. Okay, so uh, this might make this result a bit more palatable, uh, this uh, large energy shift of the oscillator, because you can think of that, some of that as Bayesian. Um, yeah, I'm not the one who realized this. This is in that, in that paper here. Okay, and uh, just for people who might be confused, the, the different oscillation rates, um, right? Why does the qubit appear to oscillate at a single frequency? Uh, this just has to do with the fact that uh, if you like, there's like a uh, expected photon number, and then uh, some other these other photon numbers have um, kind of decaying probabilities, and for the ones that matter. The ones that matter differ by a factor. Uh, their oscillation rates differ by a factor, which approaches one as you uh, increase the power. Okay, but despite this, this kind of Bayesian shift of the mean photon number does not vanish in the power goes to infinity limit. Now, do you expect the uh, James Cummings model to break down at that limit? Is it some RWA approximation? Is that or is that outside the scope of this model? Yeah, it's kind of out, outside the scope of what I was. It just phys physically, there's <laughs> other things happening. So. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Um, okay, yeah. So, why does using a degenerate coupling make a difference? So, if we, if we we come back to our question about the Bayesian statistician. Uh, now they can't gain information because these oscillations are happening at the same speed. So this Bayesian effect kind of goes away. Um, and uh, when we do the math with this degenerate coupling, we get a result and it happens to be the same as the clock result. And I personally take this as a uh, reason to think that the clock result is somehow more fundamental. Yeah, what this is saying is that if you know you prepare the same measurement basis every time, you get the result where you definitely prepare the measurement basis. Whereas if the rates are different, you're not preparing the same measurement basis every time. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't match up. So, this is it. All right, so I said that there were experiments uh, along these lines. Uh, and so here's a plot from those experiments. Uh, so they didn't do the full James Cummings measurement model uh, uh, that I did. Uh, instead, what they, what they do is they prepare a qubit in the ground state. Uh, they perform a drive by an angle theta, and then they do their qubit energy measurement. Uh, and they don't do a second drive. To, to rotate back. They just drive by theta, measure qubit energy. So it's either going to stay in the ground state or it's going to end up in the excited state. Uh, and each of these curves corresponds to uh, a different measurement outcome, G or E. 
And these curves give the uh, photon number shift these different outcomes. So, so importantly, you also have to measure the photon number and the pulse that's doing the rotation, right? That's the yeah. Part. So the so the idea is that there's an input pulse, uh, and some of that escapes. Some of that becomes the output pulse, and uh, that output pulse has a different photon number from the input pulse. You can measure that as these curves show, uh, and they show it as a function of the post selection. And so delta n is the output. Post measurement minus the input number of photons. Yes. Uh, now, if the qubit and the oscillator were coupled by the degenerate interaction, this E curve uh, would be flat at minus one. Basically, this, if using the degenerate action interaction, this E curve would basically say if the qubit started in G and ended up, ended up in E, we gave an excitation to it. Uh, on the other hand, if we started in G and en ended up in G, you, you might expect that we gave no excitation and the degenerate interaction would actually give zero. But in practice, <laughs> this uh, cavity QED coupling that we just naturally get um, gives these other results here. And uh, I actually came up with uh, equations that essentially describe these. Uh, these results pretty well, I believe. Um, uh, so here they are. So this these uh, this blue dotted blue curve is uh, given by this equation, and this uh, dotted red curve is given by this equation. And you can see agreement with the results within this envelope, if you will. And what is that envelope? Well, that's that's kind of our weight theorem again. Um, the input power has fluctuations, and those fluctuations really need to be sufficient in order to, to see the shifts uh, that I calculated. So the shifts that I calculated occur in kind of the limit as you increase the energy uncertainty. Okay, so we're nearing the end of the talk. Uh, so some of you may be thinking that a lot of this sounds like weak measurement. Uh, so what's the analogy between this and weak measurement? So in weak measurement, we have a pointer shift. And here we have, we've been calculating energy shifts of the measurement apparatus. Okay, so the analog of the readout of the pointer is the energy of the apparatus. Uh, in weak measurement, the pointer is noisy. And in the measurements we've been considering, the weight theorem tells us we need energy uncertainty. All right. The pointer shift measures some uh, observable of qubit. And uh, if you like, it measures the, the average of uh, the qubit observable. Whereas the energy shift of the measurement apparatus kind of measures the energy shift of the qubit. Uh, this energy shift of the qubit occurring due to a strong measurement. The reason I say that is because the energy shift of the apparatus must be opposite to the energy shift of the qubit when we don't post select. All right, so in weak measurement, we have uh, a coupling that translates pointer readout depending on the qubit variable. And uh, so what is the energy shift of the measurement apparatus caused by? Well, it's caused by the fact that a strong measurement is changing the qubit energy. And the conservation of energy constraint is essentially dragging the apparatus energy in the opposite direction to compensate. So that's how the energy of the measurement apparatus is shifted around. Okay, and of course, in weak measurement, we can get anomalous weak value shifts when we post select. And uh, what we've been considering, we can get anomalous energy shifts when we post select. 
so in the audience, there's probably some uh, quantum foundations and interpretations people. So uh, the weak value of qubit observable, um, some might say describes the value of the qubit observable in a PPS ensemble, a pre and post selected ensemble. Uh, and so I think the analog to this notion is that uh, this final mean energy minus the Hamiltonian weak value describes the value of the qubit energy shifts in a pre and post selected ensemble. And to kind of support this notion, I mean, is the fact that the clock energy shift was equal and opposite to this. So you could think of the energy shift of the measurement apparatus as essentially uh, measuring the energy shift of the cube. All right, so we've uh, arrived at the end. So just to summarize, we constructed measurement models that respect energy conservation in two different ways. Uh, this allowed us to analyze change in the energy of the measurement apparatus when a particular measurement outcome or post-selection is achieved. Uh, we found that many, mean energy is not conserved for specific outcomes, only when all outcomes are considered. And we saw that anomalous shifts were possible, similar to weak values. We also found that the particular measurement approach or protocol used affects the apparatus energy shift. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank Cyril for uh, really insightful discussions uh, throughout. Uh, really exposed me to a lot of the experimental work that was being done uh, in this area. And I'd like to thank Leia for uh, exposing me to the quantum clock model, which I forgot to mention comes from Gizan uh, and also Aharonid. Um, so, so yeah, there's a, uh, and I'd like to thank my advisor, Andrew, of course. We've got a uh, preprint in development. Uh, Hope to have that ready for you guys soon. Thanks. I am sure. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer, for a very clear and well presented talk. Uh, we have time for questions that people would like to uh, discuss. I also have some back. Ah, yes. Yeah. Can you go back two slides, I think? Um, yeah, here. So your last uh, your last point. <clears throat> um, so I thought that the, the takeaway here was that the energy shift of the clock in qubit would not match uh, case by case. So what is it you're saying here at the very end that these things that you get the negative of the energy shift? Yeah. Uh, so what, what, what doesn't match? is the expectation value of the qubit Hamiltonian in F minus the expectation value of the qubit Hamiltonian in I. Okay. Okay. So the, the weak value, so, so what I've been saying the energy change of the qubit is, is just the final expectation value minus the initial expectation value. I what I'm, the, the possibility that I'm considering in this pink uh, rectangle is that really the, uh, qubit energy assignment should incorporate past and present, uh, past and future information. Okay. Other questions? I have a question, Spencer. So have you then, if you go back to these examples with the, uh, the all red cases, show me, show me back to those really weird cases. Um, okay, you'll have to let me know. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. I want to see some dice plots. Okay, wait, wait, yeah, uh, keep going. Yeah, go back to the clock model. This one? Yeah, that one's good. All right. So suppose we did an experiment in that, and that, and this, and the six dice came up, and we see that both the qubit and the meter lose energy. Does that mean you've just disproved conservation of energy in the world uh, and in this instance? Yeah, my, my thought, 
basically be no. Uh, Why? The reason being that energy is uncertain in all these cases. Uh, and so you could say that this was always possible. <laughs> Tell us more about that. Uh, so the initial state of the qubit oscillator had various possible total energies. And, uh, and in fact, when, once we get this six outcome, we still have various possible total energies, but those new, uh, these final possibilities, if you like, they were always contained within the initial spread. That's, that's. And uh, also, yeah, I mean, uh, energy conservation and quantum mechanics, I feel like really should be thought of uh, at the global level. I mean, yeah. So, so, so then you're saying then that if I took those initial uncertainties and reduce them before I started this game, this wouldn't happen. Yeah, I mean, you can't get an energy that's outside of the initial range of possibility. Yeah. All right, good. So, so, so the conclusion is not that energy is suddenly not conserved, but that there were intrinsic uncertainties in energy to begin with. Yeah. Okay. Related to the delta you're defining here, this is final minus initial expectation value delta. Yeah. So how you're calculating the delta may also be a question here. Is, does that really represent the right energy gap sure. to keep track of? Yeah. I think that um, maybe what that last slide is actually hinting at is that there's this different quantity which really is properly conserved during these interactions. You can see exactly that one system loses it, the other system gains it. So maybe that's sort of your stand in on a case by case basis for for an energy in these cases. It's certainly conserved over an ensemble, but that's really different than what's happening individually case by case. But you have to argue that somehow the thing that created the uncertainty in the pointer was the source of the energy that appeared later on. And that's a plausible way to explain it, <clears throat> but you're kind of forced into that. But an important point here, Spencer, is that you measure both the energy of the qubit and the energy of the meter, right? And so those deltas are the measured energy of meter and qubit before and after the experiment. On average. On average, when you get the post-selection. But on average, meaning the state's expectation value is only an average energy. So you have an average energy in the final post-selected state minus the average energy in the initial post-selected state, which is not the same thing as a trial by trial gap in energy. Yeah, I don't think I ever really said that we were deliberately performing energy measurements at the end, uh, but we could. And yeah, this is the that would describe the shift of the mean. <laughs> right. that, that's a, a crucial, subtle point. Is it's not necessarily the right energy gap, even though it seems like it could be the trial by trial, you get a different result than the mean of each state. That that's true. That's what that, that's why the angle brackets are important. Right. right. Yeah. So yes. So, so in some sense, what you've done with this selection is you picked out some subgrouping of all the possible trials and averaged those, right? But you could do a further uh, uncoarse graining where you look at the, the raw outcome by outcome events, and then you have further, further spread. I have a very simple proof for you about why that weak value result is fundamental, which I can give you on the board in a second, if you like, uh, which talks about the individual trials and why it's the weak value. But I can do that afterward. Okay. You can add it to your paper. It's already published. So Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering. So, in this case, we see the apparatus energy decreasing in all instances. So, is it just an artifact of choosing the initial state and final post selection, or the, is it something inherent to the apparatus or the way we measure? Well, I guess as Justin just said, this is the this is the fundamental result. <laughs> I guess is what you're saying, right? Weak value is the fundamental. I mean, the clog the clog model is somehow giving the fundamental result. Yeah. The, the, yeah. And so uh, the fact that these are all red would then be determined by uh, the fact the qubit initial state and measurement choice. And uh, yeah. 
Yeah, but on. but yeah, I mean, it is important that we're using the clock model. Uh, I, I would suspect that you would get very, you can get, yeah, you can get very, you can get different looking bars by by doing this uh, James Cummings approach instead. But I guess the important point is you're not but deliberately it, doing, you mentioned this, but I want to stress it. You're not deliberately doing weak measurements of energy. Yeah. It's not what you're doing. Yeah. And, and in fact, I, I wouldn't necessarily say what the James Cummings model is showing is that it's, it's um, implementation dependent. I think what you're actually showing here is that the James Cummings model is not a faithful reproduction of this, this energy measurement and F basis. What you're doing is measuring F on average. I think that that, that may be F. that may be a fair point, but I think my point is that when when I say that it is faithful, or, or it's, faithful it, it's basically in that it is possible to increase the energy uncertainty of the oscillator to achieve this pre and post selected ensemble that is targeted to arbitrary accuracy. I think that's that's the sense in which I I would say it's faithful. In this n goes to infinity limit. Okay, so in that limit, then you're saying, yeah. I mean, it's possible to reach arbitrary accuracy in that limit. Yeah, but the the catch is you do have to you do have to lower the well, you would have to lower the vacuum Robbie frequency is like yeah. square root of n. Because because fundamentally, what you're doing is is rotating by an uncertain amount. So the measurement basis you end up with depends on that random phase that you're. You're getting so you're just measuring in a whole bunch of different bases that are kind of around f. Mm -hmm. Of course, the more spins you do, the wider that angular mm -hmm. range is going to be. Yeah, and <laughs> so you're going to get all sorts of noise from just measuring in the wrong bases. That, that's that's true, but I, it it is possible to construct a limit uh, where it's work out. You do you do have to take the vacuum Robbie frequency to to fall the square root of yeah. square root of the mean photon number of the oscillator but i think you i think you can basically what i'm saying is that the the drive rotations can can be made to arbitrary fidelity by with with some limit but yeah and do these these differences persist in that limit that's because the interesting yeah, yeah 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 it's that you get as you increase the energy uncertainty you get closer to the values that i calculate and, that, and the values that i calculate just yeah are those asymptotic values the values being the different values or the clock value? The, those cotangent formulas, cotangent. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, any last questions? All right, let's thank Spencer again for a nice talk. Hi.